The Artist's Toolkit, a training program for the artistic process, problems, background, and exercises. Hello and welcome to The Artist's Toolkit, the podcast about the artistic work process. It's nice to have you here, ready to embark on an exploration of your personal work process. This podcast is not about specific artistic techniques. It is about the creative work process and its pitfalls. So we're not going to look theoretically at artistic works, even though we may have to look at theory from time to time, but it will always be about practical application. And even though we're going to have wonderful international guests, this is not about accomplished artists talking about their personal practice. This is all about helping you, giving you all kinds of tools, exercises and texts and ideas to explore your own work process, learn about your personal requirements and the conditions under which you can work creatively. Every session has three parts. First, problem or a question. Second, background. And third, a practical exercise, which you can consider homework and use for training. Afterwards, I will normally provide some further reading tips. And please, please, please have a look at them. These are hand-picked texts which have proved invaluable over a long period of time to a lot of people. And they're really, really worth it. So today, today is the first session. And as it should be, the first session is about one of the most basic requirements for being creative and for the artistic work process per se. It is about an ability without which nothing works. Of course, in order to work as an artist, specifically as an artist, you need very complex skill sets. And the skills required vary, of course, according to which project you pursue. So if you are into making six meter long historical oil paintings, of course you need different skills and different knowledge of material than if you want to do community-based performance in the metro station, both of which I greatly encourage and recommend. But before we get there, you need this one basic ability. And if we were together in the same room now, which I would greatly enjoy, we could start a discussion and everybody could pitch in and, and describe what he or she or they think is the most basic and fundamental requirement before you can start an artistic work process. And some would say, this is about observation. Or others would say, this is about perception. And someone else always says, it's about self-expression. We'll come to that later. Uh, or drawing. And of course, all these are important aspects and, and important things and good to know. And all this is stuff that needs to be practiced. And the good news is it can be practiced. The good news is actually, in many aspects, art is a lot like sports. <laughs> and a lot of it is just training and dedication. And you keep trying and you keep, uh, you keep working on it. You keep working on your co coordination. You keep working on your physical skills and also on your mental skills. What I'm saying is, we are talking here about one ability that is not very much appreciated in our culture in general. It's not appreciated at home, it's not appreciated in school, and also most often not appreciated in the workspace. It's something that our education is trying to get rid of, and this is actually a problem for our creativity. And this ability is the ability of making mistakes. Because you cannot be creative. And if you cannot be creative, you cannot work as an artist if you are not able to make mistakes. There are obvious reasons for this. Yeah, I mean, when you're a child, your parents don't want you to make mistakes. They don't want you to mess up the house. They don't want you to hurt yourself. They don't want you to hurt others. Mistakes are a, a disruption in of the daily processes our parents don't like us making mistakes same goes on in school right in school we learn that there are right and wrong answers and we are supposed to find all the right answers and we will be rewarded for the right answers and for the right answers only and 
Actually, our brains are quite similar to our parents and our teachers. Our brains enjoy doing stuff that they already know. Our brains are kind of routine animals. They're also efficient. They prefer to do stuff that they have done before. They prefer stuff they know. They don't enjoy doing new stuff because that costs energy. And in some ways that is good, but of course, in many ways it isn't. Especially not when our brain persuades us to keep repeating patterns that we have learned maybe at home and they're not fully functional, that are more like very dysfunctional, but we keep repeating these patterns which are not good for us at all, but because they feel like home. And we have to invest energy to get out of that. So that is an example for a mistake that isn't going anywhere. This repeating mistakes is not a good idea. But the difference is making mistakes while you're trying to get somewhere. For example, I don't know who can remember what it was like to learn how to walk. I mean, I remember it quite well and it sucked. It sucked so much. Yeah? Your, your knees were scabbed all the time. You kept falling. It never worked. And you wanted to run and bam, you were down on your knees again. And yeah. And similar, a little later in life is learning how to ride a bicycle. Remember how shitty that was until you finally figured it out? Until it clicked? Yeah, you had to try so many times and then, then it was great when it finally worked out. Yeah. There are also quite famous examples from history about, you know, not just about making mistakes in order to find solutions, plenty of stories about that, but also stories about how wonderful inventions or discoveries were made by mistake. Don Perignon was a monk in France who was in charge of the wine production for his monastery. And that was a very, very important and responsible job because um, at that time, wine was not just about getting drunk and having fun. Mm. Wine was a very important part of a diet at times when you needed wine, for example, to disinfect water, you know, put alcohol in water and then you can drink it. And of course, wine is high in calories and was an important part at times when calories were harder to come by. So Don Perignon had a very important job. He was the cellar master and one year he messed up and he spoiled the complete wine production of the entire year, which meant basically he was responsible for an entire wine harvest going down south. Luckily, he was smart enough to taste the wine he had spoiled. You know, this wine that had started sparkling and producing bubbles and, and you know, that obviously had gone bad. And he decided that this wine actually didn't taste quite good. And ta-da, champagne was born. Or we have a similar related story in Germany about pretzels. You all know pretzels. I hope you all like pretzels. And um, pretzels are produced by glazing the dough before baking with a thin salt solution. And the story goes that a baker's boy who was supposed to put the salt solution on the baking trays put it on the dough instead. And there was the salt pretzel. And great idea. So this is part one. This is part one about our problem. The problem that we are not taught how to make and how to cultivate the ability of making mistakes. So there are three types of mistakes that we have mentioned here. One kind of mistake is the kind of mistake that happens because we are trying to do something that we haven't done before. One kind of mi mistake is the kind of mistake that we make because our brains don't like to do new stuff. It's very different. Yeah. One is about new stuff. One is about not wanting to do new stuff. And one type of mistake is just sloppiness, messing up, and then being able to recognize that the result may still be interesting or yield something. So far, part one. Now, part two, background. For today, the most important message is please take it down. Please practice to make mistakes. Please find techniques to come to terms with the negative feelings that go together with making mistakes, the shame, the anger, the frustration. 
because without mistakes there are no new solutions. And you know there is a lot of complaining going on that there is not enough innovation in Europe and if it is so then this is the problem of culture. Because innovation wants space, it wants space for experiment and experiment you know it is part of experimenting that 80% of it doesn't work out. Yeah, And this means if you want to do something new, if you want to access new information, if you fi want to find new solutions, you need space and time for things to go wrong and you also need nerves. And this is the reason, for example, why our artistic project seminars aren't graded. No grades and in the end, at the end of term, the students do not have to show results, not in a classical sense. They need to show that they have been doing stuff and that they have been experimenting and trying things out. And if you come to me at the end of the semester and say, look, I wanted to do this and I tried A, B, C, D, E, F and A didn't work because and B didn't work either and C didn't work because of another reason, then I say, fine, it didn't work. Great. It is important information to know what is not working. Knowing what won't work is nearly as good as to know what does work. And if you know what won't work, at any rate, you're already one step, one important step closer to what is going to work. I'm not denying that those are not great days. No, not at all. Of course, it feels shitty. You will have these moments, everybody has them, where you want to just throw down everything, scream, and just give up in general because you notice nothing works the way you had figured it out. It doesn't look good, the materials won't do what you wanted them to do, you made a model, you prepared everything and still the large version isn't going to work. And those are important moments. The moments where nothing goes. <laughs> and these are moments, you know, that you cannot avoid, which are just part of every artistic work process and the best thing may be just to accept it and you're not the only one who has these moments you know everybody has them I have them all the colleagues have them all the other students have them it's just normal and the good thing about those nothing goes moments is that these are the points when you're beginning to push your limits and pushing your limits will give you more space it will cost you a lot of energy and that's why it feels bad. But afterwards it's going to feel great. And I promise you that you will work through this and then it will be great. And I've never seen anyone who didn't get over these moments somehow. Um, actually in German we call it the dead point. Point of death where nothing moves anymore. And it is an important experience when working as an artist and probably in general to learn that you can get over the dead point. And afterwards, you will be doing something new and you will be stronger and greater and smarter than you were before. And that is great. And you will only have yourself to thank for it. So this is why making mistakes is important. And this is why it is a pity that making mistakes isn't really valued much more. Of course, I mean, it is good that as small kids we learn to be careful, not to make mistakes that put our lives and other people's lives in danger. But in other points, well. And in fact, as women, because here normally are many women, including me, we are at a disadvantage here. Why? Because still today, in the 2020s, female education still focuses much more on getting things right. Girls are much more discouraged from making mistakes than boys. I know there are all these narratives about, yes, girls are not so wild, that's their nature, they're different, you know, girls stick to the rules and that's how they are and boys are different. And Well, that is of course a nature or nurture discussion here. But there are studies, there are scientific studies that actually show that girls are treated differently from boys and this includes the fact that boys get more leeway for experimenting and getting things wrong exactly because the narrative is well boys are wild and boys cannot be expe expected to function 
while the girls, you know, there are much higher expectation on the girls to function and to stick to the rules. This kind of education is the reason why girls are better in school, why they graduate with better grades and have better exams, and normally, yeah, also in university. But, in, you know, in real life, in the job, often that this doesn't mean that they have better careers. Because after university and after school, these things change. You do not get rewarded anymore simply for finding the right answers and doing things by the rule. You get rewarded for putting yourself forward, not too much if you're a woman, but still for networking and even for taking risks. All that stuff that we are discouraged from. So also for your careers, fellow women, it's good if you are able, if you come to terms with making mistakes. Exercise. So here we go. Part three, practical exercise. Yeah, practical exercise. How are you supposed to practically exercise making mistakes? Especially after hearing for 20 years or longer that you need to get things right and that you should avoid mistakes. Well, of course, <laughs> I have given this some thought and I've picked a, um, an exercise for you that I think will help. It is actually a classical drawing exercise, but I am asking you to see this and to think of this as an exercise in making mistakes. It's actually quite simple. It's Some of you may have already have done it. It is the so-called one-minute drawing, but please do not think of it as a drawing. And I can recommend it to do this every day for 20 minutes, not just for a week. Do it for a year or for two years or maybe if you can manage all your life and you will have the most astonishing rewards and results. So how does this exercise work? Making mistakes and practicing sketching. So we already have another important basic exercise in here, uh, an exercise of visual notation. It's not as fundamentally as the mistake making, but if you're able to very easily and in a relaxed way to take visual notations, that's always good to have and a very good skill. Now, you know that good ideas have this habit of popping up in the wrong moment when you're under the shower or wake up in the night or riding the bus or something. And then it's always good if you just grab a receipt and make a quick sketch on the backside of it or grab a piece of soap and draw on the mirror or whatever. And also this is kind of a side benefit of this exercise. And actually making mistakes and sketching are closely, closely connected. It is actually already in the origin of the word. Sketching comes from Italian schizzare. And that actually means something like splashing, squirting. It already contains that This is not, you know, this is not thorough. This is not precise. This is not the real thing. Somehow this is quickly done, you know. This isn't thorough or serious or right. This is not right. It is more or less approximate. And this is exactly what this is all about. This is what you're going to practice. So to cut things short... Sketching. The best exercise for sketching that I know is the so-called one-minute gesture drawing that was devised by Kimon Nikolaidis about 80 years ago. And the best thing is just to do it. Of course, this is the most favorite thing to hear from the person in front, right? Just do it. That's what my art teacher used to say. And though, of course, I'm not supposed to talk badly about people who are not with us anymore, I need to say that was crap. So I'm not saying you to just do it. I will tell you how to do it. Drawing exercise or mistake exercise, sketching exercise. 20 minutes a day, 15 sketches. You know, just grab a stack of waste paper, prints that have gone wrong or something, put them in a binder, have them ready, and then just do this for 20 minutes. The so-called minute drawing. Rule number one, you have 60 seconds. Please time it on your phone or on your alarm clock or whatever. Rule number two, you can do it everywhere, no matter where. You can be lying in your bed, you can be in the bath, uh, you can be sitting on the bus, whatever. No matter where, no matter when. Rule number three, do not 
look onto the paper. Please, only look onto the object you've picked. Yeah, or the situation or the group or whatever. Do not look onto the paper. Whether you're drawing your fingernails or your neighbor's backpack or, you know, the spaces between the leaves of your favorite pot plant, whatever, I don't care, it doesn't matter. This is about watching. This is just about looking at something and taking it down quickly without lifting the pen off the paper and without looking onto the paper. Don't lift the pen, don't look. Rule number four, it is necessary to look on the, on the paper to check because it doesn't matter what it's going to look like in the end. And those are the four rules. 60 seconds, no matter where, no matter when. Don't lift the pen, don't look onto the paper. And it really does not matter what it looks like in the end. Please do this until the next session every day. 15 drawings every day, 20 minutes. It's not so much for homework. You know, normally when you have a class at art school or university, you're supposed to work for this class at home three hours a week or something. So you're getting off quite well with 20 minutes a day. What is this about? Well, the best results are probably going to be those where you cannot even recognize what your original object was. And actually, this is not what it is all about. This is just about watching. Proportion, correct silhouette and so on. That's all for later and for elsewhere to study. You know, it will happen on its own or you will find out elsewhere. This is just about watching, about taking something down, taking notes. And it doesn't matter at all what ends up on your sheet. The important thing is that you have looked. And this is where it starts. Because I promise you that your well-trained brain is going to tell you, nah, this won't do. You know, this must look like something. There must be something recognizable. No, it mustn't. It needn't and it mustn't. Please tell your brain, dear brain, yes, you're normally right, but not today. Shut up for a minute. It doesn't matter what it looks like. I'm going to do my thing here and we can talk afterwards, okay? That's what you do. And this is the job and this is what's so difficult here and which you will notice. It's really difficult to do this kind of visual notation so carelessly because we always have an idea of what things are supposed to look like. But I promise you, you will get the best results if you can get rid of that idea, of this idea what the result should be. And if we were able to be in the same space, which I would love, I would have brought a few examples of my own and colleagues' examples so that you won't feel intimidated and you know that this can really, 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 this is allowed to look like nothing at all. That's fine. Because this exercise is about something else entirely, as we said. Summary for today. A. There are no new solutions without mistakes. B. This will feel really bad in between. You will come to the point of no return. It will feel shitty. But afterwards, you will have much more self-confidence and strength and nerves. And I promise you, you're going to solve your problems. C. First small exercise to get into the swing of things and to get rid of the idea of what the results should look like. And one minute exercise, 15 sketches, 60 seconds every day. Don't lift the pen, don't look on the sheet. It doesn't matter what it looks like. So that's it for today. I'm looking forward to meeting you again. Keep doing your work and see you then. Further reading. For further reading, I recommend an all-time classic of US-American art education. It's a book that was first printed in 1941 and that has been continuously reprinted in the last 80 years. And that's some Kimon Nicolaides, The Natural Way to Draw, a Working Plan for Art Study. The editing house is Houghton Mifflin Company, Boston. And as I said, it's continuously being reprinted. It's very easy to find secondhand copies. It is one of my favorite books. And 
it's probably one of the things I would try to save if my apartment were on fire. And please read how to use this book. That is page one to four. And exercise number two on the gesture drawing, page 14 to 22. But of course, it is eminently readable. And I recommend very much to read or better even work through the entire book. The Artist's Toolkit. Conceptualized and presented by Kater Wenzel. Assistance, Nodja Driller. A project by European University Flensburg.